Our second reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, and then continuing with 25 through 30. Hear now God's word for you and for all of us today. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O eternal God, we thank you for this witness from Matthew's gospel, which we have just read, and for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, and the one who gives us rest. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock, our strength, our hope, our love, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, Craig and I, as preachers, we almost exclusively pick passages from the lectionary. Now, in case you don't know what that is, it's a three-year cycle of texts for all of the services throughout the year. And it's really helpful for planning worship. It helps us coordinate the texts with the music. Uh, It's a wonderful tool for us as we plan. It also has an added benefit in that our snowbirds, those folks who fly north for the summer, they often will find that they can hear two different sermons on the same passage, their church up north reading the same one that we are. But you know, the lectionary isn't perfect. Sometimes the group that put it together, they made some rather awkward choices. So take, for instance, the Romans text that Cindy read so expertly. It's quite a tongue twister, so thank you, Cindy. Um, You see, it ends with verse 25a, and what that means is it's just the first half of verse 25, okay? And I think recently we've also had a reading that started with verse 1b, which means it's the second half of that verse. So they've even split where passages start right in between verses, which always seems kind of strange to me. The other weird thing that they do sometimes, which you'll see in our text, is that they omit certain verses, right? They have pulled out verses 20 through 24. Doing something like that, it always piques a preacher's interest, and I hope it will pique your interest as well the next time you see something like that in your bulletin. Pick up your pew Bible, maybe read through that before the service. You know, sometimes the omissions, they can be rather benign, sometimes just a weird sidebar in Scripture. Other times, uh, Scripture jumps back and forth between stories, right? 
But there are other times, like our passage today, where they omit verses that can be a little uncomfortable to read in church. You see, in these missing verses, Jesus, he pronounces condemnation on three Galilean cities. These cities, they're singled out for failure to embrace the message that John and Jesus bring to them. And Jesus' words are particularly harsh because he has done works of power there, and yet they still do not believe. And this is not what we typically imagine when we think about Jesus, right? We don't think about angry Jesus. It seems so un-Jesus-like if you read those verses. So, of course, the lectionary committee, they, you know, made the decision, let's pull those out and, you know, we're going to uh, slap a more hopeful message onto the end of this passage, something more appropriate for worship, something we're more accustomed to coming from Jesus. So we have this reading that's kind of in two halves, which, of course, will produce a sermon in two halves, right? It includes both a challenge to us this morning as well as some wonderful reassurance for us. And like our reading, I want to get the uncomfortable part out of the way, so we'll start where our passage began. And that's with Jesus telling a parable about children what he calls this generation, the people of his time period. It's not certain exactly who's included in the this generation that he cites, but it's a pretty general term. I think it's safe to say we can understand it as most of the people that Jesus interacted with, especially those who do not believe. And Jesus, he compares them to children, and that in itself is a form of rebuke, right? When someone compares adults and says they're acting like children, that's not a compliment like 98% of the time. Well, Jesus, he goes on to say that they are bickering like children, calling back and forth to each other in the marketplaces. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. Well, we wailed, and you did not mourn. I think we all can imagine those children. I think we've seen that bickering back and forth, right? Maybe in our grandchildren or their friends. Well, and like many parables we find in Scripture, there are a number of ways that they can be understood. The most prevalent one for this parable seems to be that it's a metaphor for the rejection of both Jesus and John. You see, John is the one who wails, calling the people to repent and turn towards God, but they refuse to do that. Jesus is the one who plays music, who brings good news of great joy to all the people, and yet no one dances, no one celebrates. Instead, they dismiss John as one who is possessed by a demon, and Jesus as a glutton and a drunkard who associates with lowly and unliked people. But you see, the point of Jesus' parable here is that his generation, the people he has interacted with, they've failed to understand who he is. They've failed to respond appropriately to what is going on around them. It should remind us of Paul's call to rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, right? This generation has apparently not done that. Well, what what should we take from this rebuke from Jesus? What can we learn from this text, this part of our text? I think it certainly asks us to consider in what ways we are like that generation that Jesus was rebuking. You know, to ask the question, what would Jesus say about us today? How are we doing in regards to dancing when there is joyful music? How do we respond when we hear people wailing? 
And really, it's this second question that caught my attention this week. As a church, I think we do a wonderful job of responding to the needs of our members. Our deacons, our Stephen ministers, they're great at caring for those who are in pain, struggling with illness, those who have lost loved ones. But as a society, I think there is room for improvement. You know, the most troubling thing to me is that since 2020 and continuing on this year, uh, gun violence has actually replaced car accidents as the number one cause of death among children and adolescents, those ages between 1 and 19. That's very troubling to me, and I know it's troubling to all of you, and I'm sure we all have our own thoughts about how to respond to this issue and this problem, but we need to do something, anything to make a difference. I hope we will. Okay, well now that we've got the challenge out of the way, let's move on to the second half of our passage where we hear these wonderful, comforting words from Jesus. Jesus' words, they are soothing to our soul, aren't they? But before we get there, just a quick word. You may have noticed that in between, right in the middle, Jesus actually offers a prayer to God, a quick prayer of thanksgiving. And that's important because this, other than the passion, this is one of the lowest points in Jesus' ministry. He's frustrated, possibly even angry, at being rejected by so many people. And yet he takes time to stop and offer praise to God. That's an important reminder for us this morning that We are called to give thanks to God in all things, as Paul writes. Now, that's much easier said than done. It takes a lot of practice, but we can change a lot about our situation simply by changing our perspective. And I heard a pretty inspiring story about that this week. It was about a man who went viral on social media because he ended up being the only person on his flight. Have you heard about this? His scheduled flight was delayed over and over and over again, I think six times. He sat in the airport for 18 hours. And finally, when they were calling his flight for boarding, the gate was totally empty he found out he was the only passenger on the plane. Can you imagine that? The crew, it turns out, had been called back to work from their hotel rooms to work the flight. The flight took off about midnight. Now, everything about that, whether you're that passenger who waited so long in the airport, whether you're the flight crew who thought you had the rest of the night off and now you have to come back to work, that all sounds miserable, doesn't it? But everybody was really good-natured about it. The flight crew, they razzed the passenger that they all had to come into work because of him, and he razzed them back saying he was going to hit that call button nonstop, right? (laughs) They all ended up playing cards together. They ended up getting to know each other, building this relationship. They even exchanged phone numbers, and they have still stayed in contact. What a wonderful way to make the best of a really frustrating situation, right? Inspiration for us today. And well, finally, the best for last, right? Jesus' comforting words to us that, amazingly, at least to me this week, I found out they're exclusive to Matthew. We don't find these words anywhere else in the Gospels, not even the other synoptics of Mark and Luke. Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. 
As we said in our call to worship, we all have had times when we were weary. We all know what it's like to carry heavy burdens, don't we? And here, Jesus promises us that when we come to him, even in the midst of our struggles, that he will give us rest, that we will find rest for our souls. What a beautiful and amazing promise for us this morning. Now, it's rather interesting. A number of commentators acknowledge the irony in Jesus' offer because it comes in the form of a yoke, right? One writer says, to those who are burdened, Jesus paradoxically offers a yoke. Another writes, what Jesus offers, however, is not a hammock, but is a yoke. Now, we're pretty fairly removed from farming context, I think, here in Naples, right? But I think most of us know that a yoke is placed on a beast of burden, either for transportation or to help plow a field. It's an instrument of work, often hard labor. So why is Jesus wanting to place this on the shoulders of those already weighed down by life? Well, Jesus' yoke, it's of a very different nature. He says his yoke is easy. Perhaps a better translation from the Greek is that his yoke is kind. The burden it places on us is light. And this is, of course, in contrast to the yokes of the world. Jesus understands and acknowledges that we all must wear a yoke, right? As Bob Dylan once said, you got to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you've got to serve somebody. You see, the people of Jesus' time, they lived under Roman occupation. They were oppressed. The poor were exploited by those in power. And for many today, it's not so different. Our world impresses upon us the need to always be working, to always be productive. Giving ourselves proper rest is often seen as being lazy. We compete with each other about who is busier, who is more tired. And it seems we cannot escape the lure of material goods and wealth. All these are yokes that the world places on our shoulders. But Jesus asks us to replace those yokes for his. His yoke is of a completely different type, for it is not one he places on us, but one he shares with us, right? He doesn't place it on us. He actually shares it with us. New Testament professor Douglas Hare writes this, the yoke is not one that Jesus imposes, but one he wears. You see, in this word, Jesus may be saying, become my yoke mate. Learn how to pull the load by working beside me and watching how I do it. The heavy labor will seem lighter when you allow me to help you with it. The yoke isn't one he imposes, but one he wears alongside us. Jesus stands shoulder to shoulder with us, helps us walk through the challenges that we all will face in this journey of life. So, what burdens are you carrying today? What is making you weary? Will we take on the yoke of Christ? Will we allow him to help lighten the load on our shoulders? Will we find rest in our souls by resting in the Lord? May it be so 
this day. Amen.